you. Let us pray. O God of eternal glory, you anointed Jesus, your servant, to bear our sins, to encourage the weary, to raise up and restore the fallen. Keep before our eyes the splendor of the paschal mystery of Christ, and by our sharing in the passion and resurrection, seal our lives with the victorious sign of his obedience and exaltation. We ask this through Christ, our liberator from sin, who lives with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, holy and mighty God, forever and ever. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but, em but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. When Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you. Lord, help us to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, to follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. Just to start us off, in case you were worried that we forgot to do the passion narrative today, rest assured we will get to it. We're trying something a little bit differently this Palm Sunday uh, because it's Palm Sunday. This is a special day of celebration in the church year. And so rather than breeze right past it and move right onto the Passion, we're going to spend a little bit of time celebrating and remembering Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday. And then rest assured, we'll get to the Passion at the end. Today is Palm Sunday, this day that so many have been waiting for. Whether people have been following Jesus for a year or a few years, depending on which gospel you read, and it started off with a small group, maybe just a few fishermen. Then over time, as as the former followers of John the Baptist started following Jesus instead, by the time Jesus was preaching and teaching He had gathered a few hundred followers. By the time he was doing feeding of thousands, he had thousands of followers coming behind him saying, this could be the one. This could be the Messiah we've been waiting for, the one who is supposed to triumphantly be our king of kings and to defeat our enemies. It could be him. And so imagine this moment as Jesus has arrived at Jerusalem, the moment they've been waiting for, and as he begins to triumphantly enter into Jerusalem, they're waving palms and shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Here comes our king! And I have to wonder what some of them might have been thinking. Maybe a lot of them, as Jesus was entering. Did their minds go back to the enslavement in Egypt? 
Did their minds go back to the time that God sent them Moses to go and triumphantly lead them out to the Red Sea? And then as God parted the Red Sea and they marched triumphantly in, then the Egyptians followed in after them and the waters closed up on them. And out in terror and trembling, the Egyptians cried out, My God, my God, their God has turned against us. As he threw the chariots and the chariot drivers and the horses into the sea and destroyed the Egyptians. Was that what was about to happen? Was Jesus about to walk into Jerusalem and lay waste to the Roman Empire? Maybe it was going to be something simpler. Remembering the story of Jonah, who triumphantly entered into Nineveh, reluctantly at first, but eventually, triumphantly entered into Nineveh, looked at the Assyrian people and said, Behold, the time has come for you to change your ways. Our God is coming. And in fear and trembling, they turned and obeyed God. Was that what it was going to be like when Jesus comes into Jerusalem? Was he going to bend the will of others? Maybe Maybe they remember the time from Joshua. As Joshua led them in through the wilderness, out against their foes, the Canaanites, as they marched on the city of Jericho, and as they circled the city and blew the shofars and the walls came crumbling down, Joshua entered triumphantly into the city as they marched in and slaughtered the Canaanite people. Was that what it was going to be like? Is Jesus leading us into armed conflict? Maybe it was going to be just like just a hundred years earlier in the time that their grandparents would have remembered and told the stories about the Maccabean Rebellion, about the time the Maccabees would rise up and Judah Maccabee, the hammer, would enter triumphantly into Judah and lead guerrilla warfare against the Seleucid Empire and defeat them. Was that what it's going to be like? What is Jesus leading us into? And some, maybe a lot of the crowd, might have been looking forward to this conflict with the sword where Jesus would come in and destroy our enemies and rule as our king. Now we know, we know that's not the kind of king he would turn out to be. And many of them, if they had been listening closely to Jesus, as we know some of them had a hard time doing, when Jesus would teach and they wouldn't quite understand, but maybe some of them, if they had been listening, they would have realized that wasn't at all the kind of king Jesus would be. That he was going to come in and not conquer our foes with the sword or with condemnation or with destruction but he was going to come in and he was going to conquer them with life and forgiveness and with love because you see the great the great foe that he had come to destroy it wasn't the roman empire it wasn't the pharisees it wasn't the tax collectors the great foe that jesus had come to destroy was our distance between us and god it was the brokenness between our fellow human beings. That was the great enemy that Jesus had come to destroy, and destroy it he would by coming in and by sharing a meal, by sharing a meal with his friends and those who looked like him and thought like him, but also sharing a meal with those who didn't like him, and those who weren't in agreement with him. He shared a meal with them too. That's how he would conquer them. He would conquer our foes by not ruling as a king where we would grovel before him and wash his feet, but he would come down from the throne and say, who needs me to wash their feet? He would offer forgiveness even to those who would hate him. Even on the cross, when he would turn to the criminal at his side and say, you are forgiven to the soldiers who would spit at him and mock him, to the crowds that would cry out, crucify him, he would offer them forgiveness and life. That's the kind of king Jesus came to be. 
It makes me wonder in my own life, as we, in our lives, are we that different sometimes from that crowd of people crying out for triumphant conquering and bloodshed? We do as humans, perhaps something tied to original sin maybe. We run the risk when telling the story of triumphantly entering and saying, God is on our side and we shall prevail, to use it in the wrong ways. It wasn't that long ago that Christian settlers came across the ocean to this native land that was populated with people that they subjugated and killed and took away their children and tried to destroy their way of life and said, God is on our side. It wasn't that long ago where we engaged in the evils of slavery, where we looked at people who were of a different color of skin, came from a different land, and we said, God's all right with you being enslaved to us because God is on our side. These are sins for which we have still not yet fully made amends. We may have a long way to go before we've made amends. It comes in large and small. It comes in small, maybe in the form of every, every child who is either emotionally or physically abused by someone who says, spare the rod, spoil the child. That's what God teaches me. God is on my side. It comes from every war that is fought of a people of a different language and culture and religion where we decide we have the right to kill anyone we want because God is on our side. It comes in the form of every hate group that goes out there and says, God is on my side, so I get to hate you, I get to condemn you, I get to kill you. It can be a powerful thing to triumphantly enter in, joyously singing, Hosanna, God is coming on our side. But we need to be careful about how we use it. So how do we do that? How do we remember the right way to triumphantly follow Jesus into Jerusalem on this day? I think a big part of it is, like I said earlier, not forgetting what kind of king, what kind of conquering king he was. Are we going to be the people that are going to say, God is on our side and that's what strengthens us to go and share a meal with people? Not just our friends and family and those we like, but even with those whom we see differently. Are we going to share a meal with those because God is on our side? When we triumphantly enter into a land, are we going to use it to see how people can serve us? Are we going to follow Jesus' example and look out at where there are people who need us? And because God is on our side, we have the ability and the strength to serve them. Are we going to be the kind of people that in the midst of of difference and disagreement seek to be people of mercy and justice and that even when we're hurt are we going to follow Jesus in his pattern of forgiveness and offering life on this day I think the best way that we can celebrate the moment that Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem is to not forget what he entered into Jerusalem to accomplish and to realize that as much as he came to defeat the enemies of distance between us and God and brokenness between us, that work is not done. We still have more to do. And that's why on this day we take these palm fronds and we use them as an outward sign to say, Jesus, we will, lead, we will follow your lead into Jerusalem honoring the kind of king of kings that you would be and how you would have us serve this world in your name. That, that I think, is the best way to honor Jesus on this day when he enters into Jerusalem. And we will follow the pattern this holy week of walking this week with Jesus as he, as he has Maundy Thursday where he does the foot washing and we do Good Friday service where we honor him and remember him on the cross and we wait in vigil for that Easter day when the resurrection comes.
But let us not have this Palm Sunday be just an introduction to the next week to come. Let us have this Palm Sunday be our introduction to our commitment to following our King of Kings the way he would have us lead. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Lord comes to us humbly riding on a donkey and proclaiming a message of peace. Let us pray, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. That Christians hear and share the word of God as true disciples, we pray. Lord, hear our that all the ends of the earth receive the words of the King of Peace, we pray that all leaders of church and of state prefer humble service to empty power, we pray. Lord, that those who see the cross starkly revealed in their lives draw strength from the name above every other name, we pray. Lord, that we hope to greet Jesus when he comes again, be ready and joyful, we pray. God, our creator, you show your sons and daughters the way to freedom through the gentle obedience of your son, Jesus Christ. Grant our petitions as we seek to follow him. We pray in his name, Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. My friends in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. After we've had a chance to exchange a sign of God's peace, I invite us all to be seated for some announcements. First of all, I uh, did not have the chance at the beginning of the service, so let me welcome you one and all to this beautiful, glorious, celebratory day, Palm Sunday, here at St. James Cathedral. We are delighted that you've chosen to worship with us here in person and joining us online. Um, we are, as always, welcoming those. I do wonder, is there coffee hour today? Yes, there is. Um, we will be ending this service, as the preacher has alluded. We're going to be ending the service with the passion of Christ. It is a story that leads to silence, and we will depart this space in silence, you'll see. But we will be quietly uh, welcoming warmly people out there in the in the Kyle's place out this door to your right. So if you're visiting and you'd like to have a, a bite to eat, a cup of coffee, and just to be um, greeted here in the name of Christ, we are happy to have you come and join us for a brief coffee hour. Um, there's a lot, in a way, there's a lot and there's a little to announce here on on Palm Sunday as we head into Holy Week. There's much that lies ahead of us today, later today at 7 p.m. Um, one of the joys of working here is that, and worshiping here, is that we have very creative staff members and there is a new Holy Week offering. We are, it's called Crucifixus and this is um, a Lenten version of the Lessons and Carols format that we have back around Christmas time. So if you are a lover of Nine Lessons and Carols, I invite you to come back today at 7 p.m. to experience this new to us service at St. James. It is, a bun it is a set of choral responses to the proclamation of Mark's Passion Gospel. And so I invite you to come back. Um, it's meditative, it doesn't require a lot of us in the seats, we just get to hear the, the scripture read and hear the choir leading us through a series of choral meditations. So that's today at seven. I'm gonna invite you to look at the Holy Week bulletin uh, or, or the cheat sheet. It should be the last page in your bulletin. It's a tear-off sheet so that you'll have it for easy um, reference. There are a lot of services happening, um, many of them gorgeous, all of them prayerful. So please select uh, which ones you'd like to come for. Wednesday evening we're having Tenebrae, which goes into darkness, another stunning service. But the three services that comprise 
Um, the Triduum, the central three holy days of Holy Week, these are the services that um, just as today we're joining with Christians around the world, when you go flip on the news later today, you'll see in Jerusalem itself, people, all of the pilgrims crowding the streets and carrying their palms. The same thing will happen in Jerusalem again, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night to Sunday morning, that three-day um, great grand feast. So please do, uh, do your very best to be here as much as you can during those three days. You will have noticed that our Holy Week preacher, Stuart Hoke, who is a spiritual giant, he's also physically not, not short, uh, he's a very tall and wonderful preacher, he's a retired priest, he was at the base of the Twin Towers when they came down, he has decades of living life and leading others through the spirituality of recovery, fascinating person, fabulous preacher, you will not be sorry that you came to those services. Please do look carefully and mark your calendar and come join with other Christians as we root ourselves again in these, these essential, essential services that help us to know who we are as Christians and who it is that we follow in Jesus. There are a couple of other little um, sort of mechanical things or, or sort of administrative things. That would be that this is the final day for us to give. If you are waiting, if you're a pledge drive person who gives at the last minute, this is it. Please give to the Lenten appeal that we are all gathering up together, one large offering to offer somewhere. This year we've dedicated it to St. Martin's, our sister church in the Austin neighborhood on the west side of Chicago. They do great work there and through them we are able to join in reaching out very directly to be the hands, the heart, the feet, um, and the embrace of Christ in this world. So please do give to that. There's QR codes, you know what to do, um, where you can throw something in the plate and say, for the Lenten appeal. I think that's it. Easter flowers are being dedicated in memory and honor of folks. If you want to do that, again, everything's in your bulletin or on the website. Please feel free to do that. And the Easter Vigil Potluck, last call for that. If you would like to help us out with that, help to bring food and help us to celebrate on Saturday evening after the 8 o'clock first proclamation of Easter, we're doing a wonderful um, meal together which winds up being very late indeed, but um, it's always a wonderful time and all are invited to join us. For those who are visiting us, Palm Sunday is one of those wonderful feasts of the year where folks who are sort of church adjacent um, are drawn back by the palms. I was that way myself in my early 30s when I was not really attending church on a regular basis and it was this service that brought me back through the doors of the church. If that sounds like you, and you're feeling like God is drawing you more deeply into God's heart and perhaps into community, we are very delighted and honored that you've chosen to be here for that. Please make sure you fill out a card if you're interested in hearing more from us or telling us more about your journey. Uh, fill out a welcome card which you'll find in the pew in front of you. Give us your name and some contact information and we'd be happy to reach out to you. Now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For our sins he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. And gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, Bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and the gifts of God, for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Standing, let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us.
the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. For they said, Not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as Jesus sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another, in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. When the chief priests heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give Judas money. And so Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? And so Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went into the city and found everything as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, 
you will all become deserters. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to Peter, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. He said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. And so when Judas came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimonies did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, 
Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him to blindfold him, to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You were also with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the forecourt, then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And then, after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered him. You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again. Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. And so the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. And then Pilate answered them. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For Pilate realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to the crowd again. Then what do you wish for me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back. <laughs> Pilate asked them. Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. <laughs> so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns, thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place, of a, of the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. 
the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself? Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until the three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who was facing Jesus, saw that in this way he breathed his last, the centurion said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joses, and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, Pilate asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, Pilate granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid.
bow down before the Lord. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen.